Hello everyone. My name is Živa Kleindinst and together with Tadej Vindiš, Peter Tomáš Dobrila and Alexandra Kostic, I am one of the curators of the International Festival of Art, Technology and Science Kiblix 2020 entitled Virtual Worlds Now. I welcome you on behalf of Kibla who has been organizing this festival since 2002. With a new long-term focus of Kibla on XR technologies and art, in the scope of RUG Network of Art and Cultural Research Centers, and considering that 2020 has probably been the most virtual year we have lived so far, the key question we are asking for this year's festival is what are the virtual worlds now? This year, Kiblix 2020 takes on a new hybrid form and will consist of panel discussions, artistic research projects, which you can experience on our web page, audiovisual performances, webinars, and workshops. And you can follow our online and live streaming on kiblix.org or our social media. Today, I have the pleasure to announce the first artist talk by Untold Garden. Untold Garden participates in this year's Kiblix with the first iteration of their participatory project, long-term research project, Skilly linear or lines of demarcation. Tonight with us are Max Celar and Jakob Skote, who are directing the studio Untold Garden. They're artists, researchers, designers, and developers with background in architecture. With us is also artist and curator Sebastian Dahlquist, who is together with Untold Garden developing this project. Now I will give the word to the artist and thank you for being here with us today. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. My name is Jacob Skote. I um, was developing this project together with Mike Cheller and Sebastian Dahlquist. And this, what you see here, is our Miro board, uh, an online whiteboard where we do most of the work on this project, which is also the place where we will ho ho have this talk tonight. And I will start here. Um, on this image here, which is an image of a small, small village on a small island on the Swedish west coast called Gullholmen. My uh, family on my dad's side is from these small islands, ultimately. Um, these small fishing villages have a quite peculiar informal urban planning practice. So when a new house is to be built, the outlines of the house is placed on the ground with planks. And then all the villagers are allowed to walk around and kick around these planks until everyone agreed on the position and the shape of the house. And this is a method they use to make sure that they use the land as efficiently as possible because the land is scarce at these small islands. And also to make sure that everyone feels that they get their voice heard in this process. Uh, this is not uh, a specific urban planning practice to this, um, these types of um, villages, but these exist in informal villages and informal urban planning processes all over the world and was the main way of organizing a city before we had urban planners and urban developers. So the project we're talking about tonight is Schiljelinjer, which is an art and design research project that explores a modern iteration of these kinds of informal urban planning practices. And we do this through workshops with an augmented reality design tool that we have built that lets its users design collaboratively on a project. This project is funded by Kulturbryggen, which is a subsection of the Swedish, Swedish Art Grants Committee. And our first showcase of it is here at Kiblix, which is super fun. Uh, I can just tell you briefly about the tool. It's sort of like a combination of SketchUp and Reddit, if you know what those two are. It's a tool that lets users design things in a shared space and then vote on each other's designs. These proposals can then be sorted depending on their vote ratio. That is the ratio between votes for and votes against a proposal. In that way, we can find what proposals are the least and most popular. And most importantly, we can find the proposals that are the most controversial. Schiljelin, uh, the name of this project, is a Swedish word that is sort of intranslatable, unfortunately. It sort of means um, lines of demarcation, uh, like a line that divides two separate things. Like you, you can say the beach is the Schiljelin between the sea and the land, but it's 
more often used in a metaphorical sense, but it's not the separation itself. It's more like the point where these two things that are separating are converging. Um, so maybe like you could translate it into diverging lines or divergent lines or something like that. And the project is based on three different explorations. The first is collaborative design methods, um, which is super popular right now within urban planning and architecture. It is basically like a way of getting all the different stakeholders in a, in a space or a site to collaborate with and share the outcome of the design of that space. For example, we have here the MVDRV Alameda Osterwald the architecture and the architecture office and VDRV did a master plan that completely got rid of the master plan and let all the inhabitants design the space completely as they wanted. Um, but we take these explorations of collaborative design methods and take them one step further by introducing the concept of conflict into it. So instead of basing um, the design outcome on the consensus, on the, like, what people agree on within this project, we instead explore what happens if we base the design of what people do not agree on. Like for example, here we have a picture of a forest. Um, the different plants in a forest don't agree on the fight for space and then it ends up looking like this. It's a constant product of their different struggles between each other. And lastly, the project is based on augmented reality, which is a novel visualization technology that brings together the real and the digital world. Um, it, you can say that AR, we spatialize and contextualize often very abstract data. And in that sense, it's super important as a way of democratizing urban planning and architecture, because AR can bring back the abstract plans and drawings into the real world so that people that aren't professionals, professionals can access them and understand how they fit together. And so our research is done through different workshops where the participants use this tool collaboratively to design responses to a particular brief. We will do quite a huge number of different workshops with different briefs, and all of these will form the basis of a research paper and a manual on how to implement these methods of collaboration based on conflict. And in the context here of Kiblix, we have an unknown people that are welcome to participate in the brief, which Sebastian will tell you more about now. Yes, thank you. Um, so within the brief, we take as our point of departure the ways in which the pandemic radically has disturbed our relationships to what we refer to as home. So during the last 12 months, it has more fully been transformed into a site of consumption and precarious labor. So together with participants visiting Kiblix and through the use of the Skiljelinje tool, we ask all of you to collectively explore the ways in which you can revert the current logic of the home by creating new tools and interventions for unproductive ways of being. And uh, we will end this talk by speaking a bit more about how in practical ways and also uh, read you the brief in its entirety. But I will move on now to speak a bit uh, or to maybe present some perspectives which shed some light on the conceptual framework which we operate within uh, when performing this research. Um, and I would like to start with uh, the concept of agonism uh, something that uh, Jakob approached uh, earlier in his introduction when he told you about the reason for the name Skiljelinja and the history of that word in a Swedish context. So as you see here on the Myra board, we have a quote by the Belgian political theorist Chantal Mouffe. She wrote and said, uh, all forms of consensus are by necessity based on acts of exclusion. So agonism, uh, on the other hand, might be described as the space somewhere between antagonism and consensus. So discourse amongst adversaries rather than between enemies. And in terms of game theory or sports, agonism is a conflict between opponents who incite mutual struggle, respect and admiration. And within the research project, we work 
specifically, but not only with urban space and the built environment, as Jakob said earlier, and an agonistic urban space, uh, we believe to be a space open for self-criticism and new ideas about alternatives to the prevailing order, as opposed to one which is based on consensus, which then needs to obscure and obliterate all kinds of questioning. So how we imagine urban space has a major consequence to how we can see our own participation and collective participation within it. And within Skilje Linje then, we explore the ways in which decision-making processes within design and urban planning can not only make way for the census and establish this agonistic space, but actually depart from it. And when using the word the census here, I relate to the definition by Jacques Rancière, who defined it as, and this is a quote, a conflict between two regimes of sense, two sensory world, worlds, end quote. And moving from uh, the concept of agonism to a format or spatial logic, uh, which it's very much open to specifically the census. I want to move on to speak a bit about the commons and maybe return to the forest, which you introduced a few minutes ago, Jakob. Um, because historically, or maybe to start with a quote, it has been said before that, and this is a quote, the commons remain invisible until they are lost, end quote. Um, and historically, the commons often refers to forests or land used collectively to provide for the needs of a certain community. The opposing force is the enclosure occurring when common resources are stolen or taken control of by private interests in the pursuit of profit, thus destroying the essence of commonality as the commons becomes policed and restricted to those with power and econ economic force to the detriment of all. And this image here on the Myra board is from a Almenning school, you call it in Swedish, like a commonly owned forest in the northern part of Sweden, in Jokkmokk. And this is a region of our country which uh, has for a very long time been a central part uh, to the Swedish Sami community. And the reason why we use an image of this specific piece of land and this specific piece of forest at the moment is due to the ongoing battle regarding the interests between the state-owned business Sviha Skog, uh, the governmentally owned business owning uh, woods and processing uh, woods, forestation, deforestation on the one hand, and that of the Sami village uh, Luktamava on the other hand. So I encourage you uh, all to sign the petition, which is currently uh, online, uh, in order to protect this piece of land, which has been used over so many generations. Um, there is a professor of political economy and social, social change whose name is uh, Massimo De Angelis. And I think his definition of the commons, uh, both historically and today, is, is a quite good one. So I'll reference it. Because he says that uh, all commons uh, consist of three different parts or components uh, which need to be present simultaneously all the time. So in, according to him, all commons must involve some sort of common pool of resources understood as a non-commodified means of fulfilling people's needs. Secondly, the commons are necessarily created and sustained by communities. And lastly, they are dependent on the practice of commoning, so too common, the, the verb. And he's putting a lot of emphasis on this, and I think this is uh, really the foundational dimension. So it's emphasizing, emphasizing the fact that the commons is uh, a practice. It's something which needs to be in a constant making. 
And today we see how the many resources needed to sustain life as enclosed, be it food, land, knowledge, culture, technology, buildings, public services, and the welfare state as such. In the magazine or newspaper Financial Times, the economist John Kay wrote that you do not need to own the road, only the toll booth on the traffic artery. And I think this is a great way to sum up the logic of digital infrastructural and technical enclosures today, made use of by techno-capitalist companies controlling the public access to infrastructure, popular culture and information. And uh, we recently found this uh, image on Shutterstock, which you see now on the Miro board, uh, which I believe to be maybe the, the best uh, summary of the tragedy of the commons that I have ever seen. So it's referencing this uh, uh, saying or the concept of the tragedy of the commons, uh, which was first coined in an essay from 1833 by the British economist William Forster Lloyd, but then it was popularized again uh, by Garrett Harding. And you can see here it says uh, it's for a conceptual, it's a conceptual business illustration. Um, yeah. So to end this part about the, the commons, we might think of the commons as an ongoing problem in the sense that it is never settled, finished or static. So as a framework, site, concept or temporary transformation, it is dependent on a constant making and remaking. And with this research project and the creation of the digital tool, Skilja Linear, for participatory design decision-making processes, we are trying to find new ways of enabling these kinds of negotiations. So the tool itself is not the goal, but the design and the decision-making processes we seek to enable and research are the goals. Um, and. Uh, I want to move from the uh, commons to the opposite of the commons, one might uh, argue, uh, namely the desire for the governable city, which is a city not open for agonistic transformations and appropriations. And I would like to start with this image, uh, which is from uh, the 17th century and the city where one of the three of us is located at this very moment, namely London. And this is an engraving showing a dead cart being used to collect the bodies uh, during the, or the bodies of plague victims during the Great Plague in London. So during 1860, no, sorry, 1665 and 1666, a fifth of the population died in the city of London. So in the course of the 17th century, as the plague was raging throughout Europe, new models of policing began to play a significant role as a new way of governing. Instead of understanding governing as, a natural, as natural in the sense of a theological, cosmological continuum, it now became an art for the first time. This art was thus a technology, what Foucault calls governmentality. At the beginning of his famous chapter on panopticism, he writes about one of the greatest threats, not only to the lives of human beings, but obviously, especially to the city and thus to the state, namely the plague. Foucault describes the techniques of control dealing with the, the plague in a very interesting way. What was to be controlled and regulated was, of course, the infection, the touch, the contact between bodies. And within the French state, which he is studying, but I would argue this goes for most states in uh, other parts of Europe at the time as well, uh, 
So the French state thus enforced cleaning schedules, which everyone had to follow. They employed workers responsible to oversee each quarter and street within the city in order to deliver food, uh, but also to control and monitor each individual. So there's an inter interesting shift here from the societal body to the uh, individualization of the societal body. And According to Foucault, this scenario of fighting the plague corresponds to a comprehensive model of discipline. He writes that each person is separated and doubly threatened in the coerced relationship to his, her body and life by both the plague, but also the state power. So plague and quarantine were, according to Foucault, a and this is a quote, trial for the ideal exercise of disciplinary power, the utopia of the completely governable city and thus of society. And thinking about and studying the development of these new technologies of control during the 17th century might help us shed some light on the various legal changes and societal transitions made throughout the world during the last 12 months in the name of fighting the pandemic, but also on the central logics and technologies of enclosures and privatization of the common as such. And to move onwards from the 17th century to today, back to today, uh, but still speaking a bit about the dream of the governable city, I would like to end this part of our talk with some notes on what we here on the Myra board frame as fake participation within urban planning. Uh, so Quilia Linear as a research project and tool poses, we might say, a multi-layered criticism of urban planning. In our cities, construction companies draw, plan, build, in most cases without the uh, active participations of politicians, architects, or citizens. And the usual criticism of this is to allow citizens to participate in the process, which often leads to unsatisfactory results as the processes are poorly designed and the form of participation not thought through enough. And in Sweden, most municipalities make use of a participatory model referred to as medborgardialog, translating to citizen dialogue, in order to make it possible for each citizen affected by a certain change in the urban material or planning to make their voices heard. However, the dialogues most often result in monologues, and it's not the citizens who are the ones speaking. So we envision the creation of this tool maybe as a way to enable processes of dialogue and neg negotiation through making in order to open up for the conflictual, but also the unexpected. And among other things, we wish to influence architecture and urban planning in a more experimental and investigative direction and explore ways to enable processes which make room for different conflictual aesthetic but also programmatic visions. And uh, I think I will leave it the word to you, Max. Yeah. Uh Thank you. So um, in pursuit of um, reaching that kind of um, experimentation or a more open infrastructure to um, facilitate uh, ar architectural and design collaboration, uh, we were inspired by large online experiments uh, in participant culture and collaborative processes. And one really good example is um, Reddit Palace, uh, where Reddit users were given access to a thousand by thousand pixel canvas where anyone could change color by one pixel, but only one pixel and only once every five minutes. Uh, in this way, users had to collaborate to write or paint something, but could 
also easily sabotage each other's ideas. So if you see on this um, a very fast gift, this was happening um, over a day, I think. Um, and um, it's, it's basically, you can see people making flags and paintings. And this was like a groups of people um, that were quite aligned in their um, goal to, to basically cover this, the largest part uh, with their idea. So um, in, in its essence, this um, was quite an anarchic process, um, but within its more local uh, structure, people for, were working better if they formed groups like, um, for example, how single cellular organisms had to connect with each other to for, for multicellular organisms to, um, to uh, be more successfully within their environment. So um, this is kind of our pursuit to, to, to find a more, um, these infrastructures that we could apply to away from the, the 2D uh, pixels, but um, also to, to kind of um, make it possible in the spatial design as well. Um, and um, <clears throat> so the digital tools today, uh, the, the digital tools are standard um, principle um, for architecture design, but they basic, they're mainly used in individual tool perspective. The decision-making process of practice have changed only marginally, even uh, though this digitalization offers completely new collaborative poss possibilities regarding decision-making, idea creation and implementation. So in software de development, scalable co collaborative tools are broadly used, such as version control system called Git. Um, and you've probably all heard about Linux. Linux was, is considered to be the largest software development project and was built by volunteers around the globe using Git. So no one was paid for it, for, but people were just joined in this um, open source mentality of uh, collective um, ownership of this intellectual property that is open to everyone and everyone shares it. And um, we really want to learn from this and um, apply it to, to design um, and, um, and kind of go beyond the structure of um, standard corporate structure, which would, for example, we could see uh, here um, a corporate structure of Apple, which where you have um, in the center the CEO, and then you have the uh, you know vice VPs and you know people who are directly reporting to CEO, and um, and then it's just a, a hierarchy that is basically all based on how many how many people can, can work together in face-to-face -face groups um, and uh, what what we we really are interested in interested in is to create scalable uh, infrastructure to kind of flatten these hierarchies um, but at the same time we 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 with with our tool um, want to separate the decision making process from the tool itself um, by creating an open source decision making framework and this framework will include many different decision making systems and structures like anarchy um, and different types of democracy uh, meritocracy uh, and more hierarchical models so um, a kind of a library of decision making processes that then um, we would uh, we could basically uh, derive from when uh, creating tools. So the Helia linear tool, as it is named now, but might be named something different, uh, which is the spatially developing, uh, is, is, this is tool for spatial design and art, um, might be just one of these tools. And then if we, so we, we really want to explore different types from, you know, uh, at the moment we only have a direct democracy approach where 
a person creates um, a proposal, if in this case, um, this uh, squares are the proposals, and then the people directly vote on everyone's proposals and everyone's um, vote is worth exactly the same. So um, how we, you know, we all in, represent our political systems are um, based on representative democracy. Um, then, you know, one of the very popular um, systems is liquid democracy, um, which is kind of half um, direct democracy and, and uh, representative democracy, where you can choose your representative to vote instead on you directly. Um, and then, um, so we are interested in as well um, in a direct meritocracy, which would in that case be um, uh, weighted credibility or merit of people who are voting. Um, so, and then depending on what the decision-making process uh, or the, the brief is. Um, so at the, in the future, uh, we you know, might have the tool, the tool could be used for different things, um, not um, on, on many different levels from, um, and, and, and then basically depending on what the decision-making process is, then we could, um, then this merit could be measured. And, um, I think Jakob will tell you more about... Um... Yeah, I'm just going to pick up, pick up from you there, Max, um, that uh, another important exploration of this project that we will get to later on is to explore the possibility of having many different types of decision-making systems within the same project. Because we have a rigidity in how our bureaucracies and how most of the process works today, where we have, like, you might have, like, a direct democratic project or like an anarchic project but the project stays in that decision making system throughout the whole project and um, we, we don't think that it has to be that way we think that some projects will uh, like need to have a lot of different phases with different decision making systems so for example when you're designing a park maybe in the first idea creation phase you want it to be completely anarchic and let people do whatever they want and vote on whatever they want and then when you have formalized something, you're slowly moving into like a liquid democracy where people are starting to find their roles within the project. Oh, I'm going to do this thing. And then I become the person that is responsible for this and so forth. Then when it comes to the stage of actual implementation, it might be necessary to have a very, very strict hierarchical kind of Apple CEO style project where people are deciding, oh, we have to do that and we have to do this. And then when you come into maintenance, you might move back into an anarchic project. And I think it's like interesting to mention here, like a little historical reference from the, let me try to pronounce this, the Gobekli Tepe, uh, that is a temple found in Turkey from 10,000 BC, really long ago. And the archeologist and anthropologists, David Graeber and David Wengro uses this as an example of proving that Neolithic societies didn't have just one social system, but two and switched between those seasonally. So in the summer, they were an agrarian culture that grew crops. And then they had a very strict hierarchical society. In the winter, they were hunter-gatherers. And then they moved into an anarchic, pack-based society. And they could live in this system when they had two completely different political systems and go back and forth between them. I think that's a, it's some sort of important like eye-opener of like how differently we could use, we could do decision-making systems in our age. And... Um, I think we can go over into showing the use of the tool. Yes, so um, first maybe we show the app itself, but there, um, which anyone with iPhone 6S or newer and uh, iOS um, 13 or, or 14 can use. Um, so, this is the link to download it, but we, we will first show you how to use it because we have no onboarding or, or um, it's still quite um, in early in the process, but it's, it's usable and you can, you're all invited to participate and um, um, propose your design ideas on to the brief, which um, Sebastian will read to you, but you could also read it yourself on 
on heliolinear.untold.garden. Um, where you want me you to go into? Yeah. Do you want me to go into the app or? Um, yeah, let's uh, let's first yeah go into the app and then we can we will read the brief. Okay, so what you see now is direct stream from Jakob's phone, and um, so he he is he's already selected a new proposed proposal, and now he's drawing this strokes. So you see on the on the you can just and it gets locked in space there on the bottom in the middle you have the um, the color selection and then on the bottom on the left you can change the width um, so if you slide it if you change the width oh yeah so you you kind of just press it and go left and right to, to and it will change the width um, of the of the stroke. Um, and then, so that's after you register because everyone needs to register so we know who is who and who is um, you know so we can measure the votes. Um, and then you can, uh, you know, maybe you should show how to also submit it as well. Uh, all right. So yeah, uh, when you're done with your proposal, I mean, you can still, you can also del select, uh, you can select one of the curves and just delete it. So yeah, um, on the right corner, you can delete as well. And then when you're done, um, you can up basically submit your proposal, clicking on the right co corner uh, um, and then um, typing your, uh, the title of it. Uh, yeah, it's limited to, it's a very short name, but um, title of your proposal and then short description as well. Um, <laughs> and um, and then you, yeah, he just clicked submit and now it's submitted, so now you can click on it. And when you click on the, on someone else's or your own proposal, then you get this review of the proposal and you see we've, we, we've hidden the um, votes for each, so you don't really know how many upvotes and how many downvotes there are, but you can see the total vote. So Jakob just um, voted on his own. Um, do you really think it's worth an uh, upvote? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, if you, for some reason, want to log out and, and, um, or anything, you, you can do that by clicking the icon on the left there. Um, and uh, you can also contact support from there and also read the brief again. Um, but yeah, so if we go to, now you can show the website, the web viewer. Now you can see, this is if you go to hilinear.antol.garden, you can um, maybe first show the, the brief. Um, so when you open the website, it's going to, to need some time to load. Yeah, and then you can, um, on the right hand side, uh, now, um, then you can read the brief and uh, maybe um, Sebastian, you could, Really yeah, so. I will read it. Uh, so as you can see there, it, it has a title, which is the Perose home. And now I will read it from the beginning. Um, the borders are tightening around you, pushing you ever closer to your body. Your home is closing in on you. 
you ask yourself, do I still work from home or do I no longer leave my workplace? You are longing for a sense of community. The authorities long for immunity. When you pronounce the two wor different words out loud, you hear that they share a common root, the Latin munus, the duty, tax, tribute or gift someone must pay to be part of the community. While pronouncing the two out loud, you think for yourself, maybe politics is in the end always immunological, the hierarchy being that between the immunized at the top and the demunized at the bottom. The pandemic has radically disturbed your relationship to what you refer, refer to as home. It has fully transformed it into a site of consumption and precarious labor. The previously unstable walls, which used to demarcate the boundaries between private, private and public, have eroded. This has made your home porous. It's now floating in and out of yet other homes. While inhabiting a seemingly unique home, you and all your neighbors are all sleeping on the same Google Sheets. Together with your neighbors around the world, we ask you to rethink how this shared home might function. Ways in which you and your neighbors can revert the current logic of the shared home as a site of production and consumption through the collective creation of new tools and interventions for unproductive ways of being, leisure and free time. Okay, thank you. Um... So basically, how do you respond to the pandemic with uh, your design? And um, then please, uh, uh, as you finish drawing your proposals, you also vote on each other's proposals. And then um, through this viewer in um, a few weeks, we will add um, uh, another voting layer to it. So people from even without the phones or people who are not participating it could still vote for it. So you can see in this viewer for you can uh, move around with arrow uh, arrow keys and WASD to 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 navigate around. Um, I don't know if it's the stream that is laggy or is it the viewer, but um, we've never tested it um, with many people in the um, um, app. Uh, so um, please um, have mercy on us, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, ho hopefully you you can enjoy. There's a few bugs bugs that um, we known issues that, for example, please don't um, register with dots and dashes, just uh, lowercase um, um, letters, and also when you try to delete a stroke, um, sometimes it takes um, a few clicks before it allows you to draw again. Um, we will resolve these issues in the next weeks, but uh, just so you're aware of it. Um, and also, please, if you find new bugs, please uh, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> there, there will be a lot of them. <laughs> so, yeah, the moment, you know, it's pretty crude um, kind of a proof of concept, um, but in the future, we really would like to add different kind of strokes, different kind of tools for, uh, you know, um, snapping on, onto the grid um, and, um, you know, on drawing on planes, importing your own 3D models in all sorts of different things. If we, if we manage, you know, to, to secure some more funding for it as well. So, um, but yeah, I, everyone, uh, is invited to go to the website and see the tool for itself and um, and explore it a bit um, it would be great and then if anyone has now now we'll basically um, move give the word back to Jiva and um, go to q a if if it's possible die hi 
Thank you, uh, Max, Jacob, and Sebastian for being with us today and for presenting your project, giving us insights and really contextualizing it, um, especially with this brief that you made uh, this time, uh, which is very much, of course, um, situated in the reality in this what we call now the new normal uh, we actually do have a question from the public and it's more related to the question of technology itself um, also something of course that the festival deals with it and um, so how much in your opinion can technology itself impact on this have impact on social change or does it only replicate the state of society as it is what do you think when especially you're working with augmented reality, extended realities, not only in the Skilly Linear project, but also in your uh, other projects, using, using all this like virtual physical blending uh, methods and technologies? I can respond to that uh, if that's okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that like technology in itself don't do anything. It always comes from an intention that is ultimately human. Um, I think that when thinking of technology, you have to start thinking about the process that you want and then design the tools after that process. Quite often what we see in the technological developments of today, we have the opposite. We have people creating tools without a purpose. Uh, and we are trying to work to tackle that from the other direction, creating a purpose and then creating the tool for that purpose. Uh, so I don't think you can couple uh, technology from anything human and talk about it as a separate thing because it's always intrinsically linked to what the humans do so the social processes that we do the social changes that we want to implement etc yeah but in the and the purpose is basically um you our our purpose is to to is is inherently it's basically inclusive trying to include more and more people so this is um creating such infrastructure and doing it with the open source way, I think it's um, basically um, can affect, even if the tool itself is unbiased and you can use the tool to draw, you know, um, killer robots or whatever, you know, um, it, you, it's still on a larger scale, the what what people make out of it and the processes that are um, underneath it influence the final design, if that makes sense. Um. Yeah, Daimana, Zdai. Thank you. Sebastian, would you want to also perhaps to respond? No, I, to do, I don't think I have any further comments for that uh, question. I think you answered it in a very nice way. But if you have any Addition, additional questions. Okay. Um, I would like to really thank you all three of you to be with us today for presenting the, the project. The project is available, of course, on our webpage, kiblix.org. Um, and I really welcome everyone who is watching now with us or who will watch later on uh, the documentation of this stream uh, to use the app and to participate in this, uh, in this project, uh, Skilje Liner. And so again, Untold Garden was with us today and Sebastian um, Dahlqvist. And thank you very much uh, to our audience for being with us and also um, being with the artists today. Um, and um, for the end of this artist talk today, I would just like first to see again the faces of our artists on the, on the screen. And um, perhaps we can wave <laughs> each other. <laughs> Since we see each other from this very uh, uh, different uh, perspectives. Um, okay. Thank you, Jiva. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you to our audience for being with us today. And uh, this was our first live stream of Kiblix 2020, Virtual Worlds Now, doing it, of course, in this virtual uh, environment. And um, tomorrow we continue with our project. Tomorrow we will premiere a first uh, project by Mark Farid seeing I, the other. It's a 360 degree video, which will be live stream from 11.45 in the morning until the end. It's, uh, as I said, 360 degree video from the person, first person point of view. And we will show a full day 
of a person from, uh, from around the globe. And follow our social media, our webpage, kiblix.org, for further program. We continue in the next weeks with very interesting panel discussions, um, audiovisual performances, and other projects which will be launched, and you can experience them on our webpage. Thank you all, and goodbye. Take care. <laughs>